Let us ask the Lord's blessing as we look at his word. Our Father in heaven, we ask your blessing upon your word as we open it. Use it to challenge us, to help us to accomplish your will in our lives. O oh Lord God, may you enable us to receive your word with meekness, to understand it, Lord, and to apply it to our lives. May the glory be yours through our Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. For the past few weeks, our theme has been the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. A very quick recap again, as the Lord gives this commandment, this exhortation to his people, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And we said there, in this statement, this shows us the fact that there is a priority concerning our lives in relationship to the kingdom of God. Seek ye first, first of all, most of all. Secondly, we observe that this entails an effort, a strenuous effort. It tells us there, seek ye first. And the word seek there is not just a matter of um, blindly looking here and there for things without any purpose. I suppose a little old Ossimor joke um, might just lighten up a little bit, and but tell you what it is not. You know the one, maybe, of uh, Ossimor. Um, a fellow saw him looking um, under the street light for something, and he saw him looking about, and he asked him, Ossie, what you're looking for? He said, well, I lost some money, and I can't find it. He says, but where did you lose it? Well, I, lo I, I lost it down the road down there. But what are you doing up here looking for it? He said, well, up here I have street lights. I can't find it down there. All right. So, but sometimes you, you think that sounds logical. You know, they've got a street light there. Well, I don't think you think it's logical, right? I hope not. <laughs> um, but this seeking has a purpose. This seeking has in it that which is a structure. It is logical seeking. Not something that some people blindly go after. Not in a religious manner either. That is not in a tradition manner that you come up as a person in the church or in some religion. And you learn what to do and what to say. When not to say it. When to sit down. When to stand up. And you know all the rituals and everything else. And you just go through it. Well you know that's not seeking. That's parroting what you've learned. That's uh, like how we learned. Um, our two times table or, or ABC and, and, and things like that and just said it because it had a nice little tune to it and the tune caught us and we really didn't understand it. Somebody, if we said, or say your ABC, we would be able to say it. But it says, all right, which letter comes after K? And maybe I should ask you that, which letter comes after K? <laughs> all right. Um, the, you know, you have to think. Which letter? Some people would not even know which letter comes after K because they didn't really learn that. They learn it like a little rhyme, a little song. Well, some people, that's what they do with the things that are spiritual. The word seek there has to do with seeking, as Paul tells us in his word. He said when he taught the scriptures, he laid the scriptures side by side. And that's what the meaning of the word is. And, uh, and to show them from scripture, from scripture what scripture teaches. And so that's what the word in, uh, has in mind. Yes, to make a great effort with all our mental capacity, with our emotional being, our strength, our physical, to seek this kingdom because it is important. And then he tells us the result of that. And then all these things shall be added on to you. And he tells us early in the passage what all these things mean. But that's not all to it. He goes on later on in his ministry and explains more about this kingdom. 
and that this kingdom is to be sought by God's children. An interesting word in the Greek. Remember in Romans chapter 3, where it says, there's none that seeketh after God. The word seek there is a little different word in the Greek to the word seek here, as in, given in Matthew. The word seek has a prefix before it means ek, what we call ek before it. And it means that you cannot you seek first. You don't have the capacity in you to seek. So when he says there's none that seeketh after God, there's none that in their own self have the ability to seek after God. All right. The word here in Matthew chapter 6 does not have that prefix on it. And then it makes a word mean that you have the capacity to seek after the kingdom of God. So the one in Romans chapter 3 relates to the unbeliever. There's none, the natural man, the man that without God's word, without hearing anything about God's word, does not have the capacity in him to deliberately go and do that. In order for him to do that, he must have, we might call this, outside or upward influence. That is, God's word, God, Holy, God's Holy Spirit speaking to that person, and then that person will be able to go on as, and make a choice. This one has to do with people who already made that choice. And so then it, makes, it gives a difference between what we call, and that's what we've been trying to, to show you during the last few weeks, there's a difference in the scriptures between what the Bible refers to as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. We tell you, told you they're the same. Matthew use it, uh, referring to Matthew, kingdom of uh, heaven, he also used the kingdom of God a couple of times. The rest use it, says, um, so the kingdom of God. Matthew, Mark, uh, sorry, Mark, Luke, and John calls it the kingdom of God. Matthew refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. But they're speaking of the same thing. But this kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is different to what we refer to as heaven. Or what we call eternity. What we call, when we die, we're going to be with the Lord. So we get saved. That's for the man in Romans chapter 3. Who needs to get saved? To be born again. The Lord Jesus told Nicodemus, Except you be born again, you cannot, first of all, what? See. The word see there means you can't comprehend. You don't have the understanding. If you're not born again. Later down, a couple of verses afterwards, he said, And I say unto you, except you be born of water... And of the of the sorry of um, and of the spirit, you cannot enter to a different world altogether. So he said, first of all, you need to be born again, and then after that, there is something else now to enter. And so, um, in order to get saved, to go to heaven, to know when you die, where your soul going to, where we call eternity, uh, and so on, that is to be born again. Now, most of you in here, if not all of you, have gone through that process already. You've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. At least I hope you have. If you have not done that yet, God gives you an opportunity to get saved. And how do you get saved? The fact that Jesus Christ died for your sins. God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son uh, into the world. And you know what, what he did for us? He was dead, he buried, and he raised again on the third day. He's alive. And the Bible says that if you believe in thine heart that God have raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's what we need to do. And that's what I believe most of you have done. And I said if you have not done that yet, don't depend on your religion. A bunch of things you just know as a young person, an old person, you know, you learn in the church, you learn the songs and whatever else. This is nothing but rituals. This has to do with a personal experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that you know you've trusted him as Savior. And you believe that he's dead for you. And you deliberately called upon him. And in whatever words you have said then, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, remember me when I come to my kingdom. God, please save me. Uh, God knows the cry of your heart, what you, what you mean. 
A lot of times words, you know, people try to learn special words to pray. But God don't, I wouldn't say care about words. God cares what the heart means. And he can interpret that. Whatever that soul means and cry out. And even right in your pew where you are. And you understand that you are a sinner. And that God loves you. And died, sent his son to die for you. And if you believe that Jesus Christ did that. And that he is able to save you. Right down in the depths of your heart. You can cry out right now. God please save me. You don't have to walk up the aisles. It's good to do that. To make a public decision about that. Because that kind of seals things. But the real thing is. When you cry out in your heart. And ask God to save you. Then he'll do it. He'll do it right now. I trust even now as I speak. If you're not sure you're saved and you've never done that, you would do that even right now. It says, Lord, I want to be saved. I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please save me. And if you do have done that, we'd like to know afterwards. Walk forward. Let us know. Let us rejoice with you. Let us pray with you. Or maybe you need a little more help about that afterwards when we sing a song of invitation that you would come. All right, so that's the first seat. But in Matthew, it talks about those who are already saved. If you read the passage in Matthew, you will see what he's talk, who, he's, who he's talking about. And in much of it, he's talking to his disciples. That you have the capacity. Now, when you get born again, that is, God gives you eternal salvation. But God gives you now the potential of enjoying this special dispensation of his, referred to as the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And this is what we've been dealing with in the last few weeks, showing you from the Old Testament and connecting it to the, Old, to the New Testament what this kingdom is that we are speaking of. And I believe that some of you, well, I know some of you know what we are speaking of, but in this morning we want to uh, say a little more about this kingdom in a different way. And we've shown you the Old Testament prophecies speaking about this kingdom in Daniel and the other places, uh, Isaiah, and we told you some things that will happen in this kingdom. Well, today, let us look at a fairly um, easy outline to remember concerning the kingdom. Much of it will be taken from Revelation chapter 20. So, you can take your Bibles and turn there with me. And last week, we showed you some things in Revelation concerning the kingdom of this earth and how the devil wants to rule on this earth. And he wants to rob us disqualify us as he did Adam and Eve in the garden when God told them rule, rule, have dominion over this earth. He came and he caused them to sin and so got disqualified. And God had to put them out of the garden. But God sent a redeemer for them as we showed you, the Lord Jesus Christ and then gave them the potential now to get back what they lost. Rulership in the garden. And this Happens through our Lord Jesus Christ as we showed you. Promised through Abraham, Jacob, Isaac and Jacob. And through the seed of David. And the kingdom would be set up. Well let's just look at this kingdom a little, um, little more. Revelation chapter 20 uh, verses 1 to 7. First, not first in necessary order. But we would put it this way. Um, about the kingdom first of all. This kingdom this morning. It tell us something about the length of the kingdom. Now. We're not talking about feet, but we're talking about time. I should say meters now, not feet. That's all time word for us from Barbados. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 to 7. Um, you've heard us say this over and over, so you should know by now. We refer to this kingdom. Yes, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. But there are other terms we refer to it. Uh, uh, and it comes from this passage of scripture. Where it tells us there um, in verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. 
And they saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. But there shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this time, length, as far as time is concerned, is mentioned as a thousand years. Now, there are... Those who believe that this thousand years is just symbolic language. And that it means that God is just using because he says, you know what Peter tells us that what they will say? A day is as a thousand years with the Lord and a thousand years as a day. Well, if you go that way, then you're in trouble because it mentions a thousand day, years here. That means it's only one day. But uh, you could interpret it in, with God, one day, it could be an eternal day, so... <laughs> Yeah. Um, right or wrong, correct. Anyhow, um, the, it tells us there is for a thousand years. Now, if you notice from the Old Testament that we've showed you that God dealt in dispensations in different ways or ages dealing with the children of Israel. And so I, we, we showed you that there was a difference between Abraham and, uh, and, uh, and David of a thousand years. And then two thousand years between David and, and the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ and so on. The, the time line given. And so there's much in the scriptures if we read and study good. You will see that God has time scheduled. God is not an ad hoc God. See God don't have plan B. God only has one plan and his purpose will be carried out. We need to keep hold on that. And so when we see the changing faces of the world, that we must remember this, that we say when we sing it so well, or we give it in a word of testimony, Jesus Christ the same, yesterday, today, and forever. He changeth not, the Bible tells us. And so God is not an ad hoc God. God is not caught by surprise. God has a plan and it will come to pass. So he has a schedule and his schedule will be on time. Now, I understand sometimes when we go into trouble or get into of trouble, troubles of life or whatever else, we say, oh Lord, I wish you would come now. Right? I always say this, not always, I often say this, if you really mean that, that you want him to come now, why don't you say, oh Lord, take my life right now. But we don't say that, right? For some reason we're frightened to die. But that's a human aspect of it. The Bible calls it an enemy. And one of these days the Bible says, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. So there's a, yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you know, there's a shadow in it. Then we need God to help us so that we would not fear. If we don't have his presence with us, we will fear. And you know, can I say, and I know, that at some time, all of you fear death, a possibility of death somewhere along. Just, even if it was just passing, um, not ready, I'm not sure I'm ready to die because of my family, or I haven't fulfilled my task. Some type of aspect of it. Anyhow, um, this time of a thousand years is a literal thousand years I take it as. Now, if I'm wrong, when we get there, don't say a pass to see you're wrong. All right? Just say, if it's longer than that, say pass, I'm so glad you're wrong. <laughs> but a thousand years with God, but that's, that's only part of it, all right? That thousand years is only a little part of what God has for us. But it's something special because he must keep his promises. The promises to the Jews and to the Gentiles, as we showed you last week, how God promised us sin. People make so much thing about the Jews and the Gentiles. And what God promised to the Jews, he promised to the Gentiles. And actually, we'll show you a verse where he actually pinpoint with Israel. He says, and Egypt and Assyria will be equal with Israel during the kingdom age will be with thee. And so, then there will be new nations, as we will show you. So, the length of the kingdom. 
is a thousand years, a particular time set that there will be in God's calendar. Then notice the place of the kingdom. Now, I think by now you should know, but we will tell you that it has to be on this earth. The earth will become the Eden that God intended it to be. Today we refer to it as not Ethiopia, but Utopia. All right? And that Utopia is, boy, something that's it. Um, utopia means, well, everything is just fine and dandy. Everything is good. Well, if we want to use the term, the Utopia will come one day better than man can imagine. When God comes upon, uh, rule upon this earth. The whole earth will experience the glory of God. Psalm 72, 19. And other places you will see referring to how God and the nations and God will rule over all the earth. Like Isaiah said in Isaiah 6. The whole earth is full of thy glory. But in Psalm 72, 19. And blessed be his glorious name forever. And let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. So the place of this kingdom is not somewhere in the sky. It is going to be on this earth. This earth, let me put it this way. This earth will be the kingdom of God. And it's not that he's just going to have a little piece there. And this his kingdom will be in a little corner. And you'll see from the Old Testament that the nations of this earth, what was going to happen. And God is going to uh, take his world, his earth, that he intended to be what it was supposed to be. And give man to take care of it. But man failed. But the God man, the Lord Jesus Christ, will fulfill that for us men who fail. But through him, those of us who failed, through Adam, he made it possible for us to reign with him in this kingdom. And so we believers must see it as this. As a place of the kingdom on this earth. Then the capital of this kingdom. We have to go out of Revelation for that. In a sense, we could show you some things about in Revelation, but we'll have to, you know, lift it out of the context to show you. But Psalm 48, verses 1 to 2, we sing that song, or that chorus, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And so God is going to rule in Jerusalem now, you know all the problems that's going over there. And, so, and then so there are some Christians say, but why Jerusalem? Well, you know something? If God had picked Barbados, Bridgetown, there'll be those in St. Vincent and, and the other countries say, but why God break, choose Bridgetown? You know? You know how it was in the Federation. Well, some of you don't know about that. When the West Indies came together for a little while and they had the capital in Trinidad and the Prime Minister came from Barbados and Something about Jim, I can't remember now. It's so long ago. Anyhow, want to know why they had to pick Trinidad for the capital? Why they got to pick a Barbadian prime minister? And what you, all the other things. And you know it didn't last too long. And one of the, one of the countries said, um, what was he said now? Something from 10, one from 10, oh yeah, one from 10 leaves what? Nine? Yeah. But he said, one from 10 leaves zero. Take the one from the 10, and you have zero. So that, the leader of that country said, if you take us away, the other islands are nothing. All right? Anyhow, so whatever God does, may, wherever he set up this kingdom, there'll be people who say, why? But God has his purpose. There's a reason why all of this as well. Um, and you know the whole world, for some reason, want to rule. There's hardly any other place in the world that's gone through so many rulers over, over the years that have ruled Israel. And still there's fighting and fighting for it. All because God says he can rule here. And Satan, remember Satan that want this kingdom not to come to pass. He wants to rule. So Satan does everything to stop God from reigning there. And so he puts all different types of people there. But God will, it will happen one of these days. Um, God promises that. All right. So in this kingdom, it tells us in Jeremiah 3.17. At that time they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. That's Jeremiah 3.17. And all the nations gathered shall be gathered unto it. To the name of the Lord. To Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after the imagination of their evil heart. I'm sorry to don't give you time to look at it. But just want to uh, read that. Sort of pick up. Get some time uh, taken care of. Because 
Um, don't want this sermon to be a part of a mini millennium sermon, all right? Uh, want to finish before a thousand years over. But then let us notice the king of this kingdom, Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I know you know that, but it's good for us just to read a few scriptures again. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, from verse 1 right through to verse 16. But uh, just we will just read verse 16. And he have on his vesture and his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And before that, we see how he comes back at the battle uh, of uh, Armageddon and he destroys these people, the nations that fights against him and so on, and he sets up his kingdom. So the king is the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the one, I think that um, fancies our attention more than all the others. And to me, the one that I want to highlight, not now, but to mention about, is how does that relate to us? And so the, the thought that the Lord Jesus Christ is the king of this kingdom, but they are what I will call the coal regents or the coal reigners of this kingdom. It gives us a few here in Revelation chapter 4, we just uh, chapter 20. I'll just read these and make a comment and move on to that because that will take up a message or two by itself. And in verse 4 we read of chapter 20. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ. Notice that. And they reigned with Christ a thousand years. So we refer to these as the martyrs of the tribulation in its context. But I suppose all other martyrs would fill into this as well. But the martyrs, those who have suffered for the Lord Jesus Christ, died uh, in the tribulation period. There are many Christians who are fearful to go through the tribulation period. So they want to believe in a pre-trib rapture. Because they're scared to get their head cut off. But, as I, I know, it's able for me to talk easy when I'm preaching, right? But I can still say, dead is dead. Right? I mean... Whether you get your head cut off or you get a heart attack, you're dead. And possibly, well, they do tell us, they tell us the way how they cut your head off with a guillotine is more painless than anything else because a way it hits there, an instant death. Heart attack, you might go, you know, how it goes sometimes, some people. But anyhow, but they're fearful of that. But notice, if it was that it was only these who were going to reign with Christ, Would you not like that you go through the tribulation? Huh? Just think, if you, if you want, if it means to die like this, is that you're going to reign with Christ. And then we forget all the promises of God anyhow when, when we the trouble, you know. God says he can take care of us. And... Wherever you go through the valley of the shadow of death, you'll fear no evil if you walk with him. Actually, the martyrs of the old time, most of them, you read stories about when they were being burnt or executed in different ways, worse than what is in the tribulation period. God gave them what we refer to more than dying grace. And they sang songs and praised God. And some of them, while they were dying in the flames, the very people who lit the flames, saw their great faith and joy on their faces and knelt down and asked God to forgive them and trusted the Lord Jesus Christ. And guess what happened? As they were kneeling down praying to God, their people came and burnt them. I don't know why we're so scared about things like that. Why? I mean, we're living in a troubled world already and you're making it all right. I mean, you have your troubles and trials that some people don't know about, but... Uh, you look all right to me. Then secondly, not only the martyrs of the tribulation, but verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in this first resurrection. I said, Jesus said blessed and holy. If it's only tribulation people, I figured you would want 
You won't mind going through the tribulation. On such the second death, notice this, has no power. That's why you're to fear. Not the tribulation. On such a second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And shall reign with him a thousand years. So those who have part in the first resurrection. Now that's a whole topic of itself. I believe this has to do with believers. Who live faithful for him. Who, fruit, who live fruitful lives for him. Who walked in the spirit and not in the flesh. But that's. We'll leave that, as I said, to um, give more detail about that. But those who have part in the first resurrection, if all were going to raise in the first resurrection, he would have not said that. What would be the sense of saying that? Those who have part in it. So, those are the core regents. Those who will reign with Christ. If we suffer with him, Paul tells Timothy, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. And he's, who's the us? He's speaking to believers. And that, not to do with deny salvation eternally. It has to do with deny him reigning in this kingdom. This particular dispensation of God on this earth. This particular age. Then they're the subjects of this kingdom. Matthew chapter 25, verses 32 to 34. Matthew 25, 32 to 34. Talks in verse 31, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, and, they sh and then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. And he shall set up the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say on to them on his right hand, Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And so, um, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, and here's 34, he says, about nations that shall be in this kingdom. We refer, he referred to them as sheep nations. And there's a lot of debate as to who they refer to. But generally speaking, they're those nations that treated God's people rightly, correctly. You read that. He says, uh, how, Lord, when did we treat you this way? How oh, when did we give you water? He said, as much as you give water to the, the least of my brethren, you did it unto me. When were you hunger and we fed you? When, did you? when were you naked and we clothed you? When you take care of God's people. That's what he tells these nations here. And nations that are anti-Christian, anti-God Judy, uh, as far as Jerusalem is concerned, is who he referred to as the goat nations there. But the nations of this world will enter, the sheep nations will enter into this kingdom. We'll go into more detail, Lord will, in another time. Then notice the blessings of this kingdom. Well, I'll tell you, uh, there's some wonderful blessings in this kingdom, but one that is found in Revelation 20. Now the Lord Jesus says, blessed is he, and holy is he, the half part of the first resurrection. But tell me, when you read Revelation 20, and there's... Something that, something he tells us about this kingdom. That we should rejoice and be glad. What does it tell us from the beginning? There will be no devil present. Even in church he's come. And trouble us. Even our de deepest meditation. Come and put thoughts in your head. In all different situations. He see you walk into, wanting to walk in a narrow way and you come to the crossword and he says, you come this way, lots and lots of joy I'll have to give to you today. And oftentimes, like the prodigal son, you end up in the pig pen. But the devil does not want us there. Praise God when we get there, he will not be there. You know, there are some people who actually believe that the devil is bound right now. You can imagine if he's bound right now. I wonder who's causing all this evil and all this kind of... Boy, I wouldn't like to be wrong when he's loosed. But there will be a time you'll see that he really gets loosed and what he will do after this period. But he's loosed. He has all his demons with him. And he's working against us. 
principalities and powers in high places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. And so the writer of Ephesians, Paul tells us to go on to resist him. Put on the whole armor of God that he might withstand the fiery darts of the devil. He's as a roaring lion seeking whom he may, he may devour. And he's on the prowl more than that. Praise God. The Bible tells us the Lord is going to take him. And he's going to put him in what we refer to as the bottomless pit. The abyss. Uh, and I always thought about this. And I saw an angel come down from heaven having the bottomless pit. The word is abyss. But I was think for a thousand years, the devil would be falling. If it's a bottomless pit and he's cast in it, for a thousand years he'll be falling. You know, one of the worst sensations to have is just free falling. But I'm not sure, you know. The word is abyss, meaning a deep hole, bottomless, because of that, and so on. He'll be in prison for those 1,000 years the Bible tells us. And then it tells us he'll be loosed after this 1,000 years. Showing you that this is a dispensation of time. Because after that the devil will be loosed. And then we'll, you know what he goes on. And then God comes and destroys him. But friends, the blessings of this kingdom in these three words. The kingdom of God is not. What? Kingdom of God is not. Meat or. But. Righteousness. Peace. In. The Holy Ghost. Now the reason why it adds in the Holy Ghost is this. Some people can feel they're living righteous. Or some people are very self-righteous. Some people might feel they have little peace in their heart. And some people might think that pleasures mean joy. And they're enjoying themselves. But that's not what God's speaking about. You see the righteousness, peace and joy he's speaking about starts in this life. That in this life. Even though the devil is around and our flesh is around, we can still live under the power of the Holy Ghost, a righteous life. We can have peace even though the world is in turmoil. We can have joy even though the world is in sadness. And that's what God is able to give those who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. And friend, if there's one thing we need in this world... Where in this world we shall have tribulation and all the other things that come with it. All the temptations of this life. The attractions of this world that calls us to it in different forms, different ways. If there's one thing we, as believers we need is to live a righteous life. We need to have peace in our hearts and we need to have joy in our souls. In this world and we can have it. And dear friend, if in this life we can have that, you can imagine in the next one. When the millennium kingdom is, there's no devil there. There's no flesh to deal with. Oh, the overwhelming joy and peace and righteousness that kingdom will be and that we will have, that we can look forward to it, dear friend. And so Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 55, sorry, 51 and verse 11. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. And everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Praise the Lord. And you can add all the problems of this life. You can add on no before them. No, no hurricane season to worry about. Boy, you know how hurricane season got some of us? June to October. And even now we're in November. We're still not sure it is all over. And you know the terror of that. Praise God. I mean, that nothing happened so far. And hope it just continues that way. Don't mind the, predict, the people who predict every year tell you the most worst hurricanes will be this year. Um, Praise God so lightning. God things in his care. But no weather problems, no well for you all the people, you know what I'm gonna say, right? No joint problems, no arthritic problems, no eye problems, uh, and all the other other problems. That only when you get old we really see them. They, they exact, exaggerate themselves in our lives. When you're younger, well, when you're younger, you would even say this. I wish I could see a hurricane, you know. 
That's because you never went through none. <laughs> hey, you're young, you just be, you know, that kind of way, right? And, and whatever else. But none of these. When you get old, you'll see that. In, in Psalm 118, verse 24, a lot of it has to do with, a prof that's a prophetic psalm. And the, the chorus we sing, this is the day that the Lord have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. A lot of people think this is Sunday. Not at all. In the context of this, this is the day that the Lord have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Refers to a prophecy of the coming day of the millennium kingdom. You know, we sing the song, this is the day of the devil's defeat. Boy, I really, I mean, I know how we sing that. And maybe we understand what you mean, but no. no. He's still living. He can get defeated when the Lord Jesus Christ deals with him. Now, we could defeat him in particular instances of our lives, but he's going to come back. He's going to come back. Sometimes as soon as you tell him, get thee behind me, Satan, he get behind you and he run in front of you. Meet you face to face. The time is, this is the day, the, the day of the kingdom, when he will be put away and the Lord Jesus Christ will reign. Now, in the time of this kingdom, exact time unknown. However, in Matthew chapter 24, turn there very quickly. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Matthew 24. Um, let, let's pick up from verse 3. And really you need, obviously we're not going to do that. We will take this chapter up in detail in a future message. But um, in verse 3. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the end of the world. The word world there in the Greek is aeon. Meaning the end of the age. Not the word cosmos. Where we find that God so loved the world, meaning cosmos, all the world, the earth, and so on. The word there is the word in the Greek, aeon, meaning age, a particular age. All right, and the coming of this age. Now, the, uh, the end of the end of this present age, and then the beginning of therefore beginning of another age. What's the age? I'll show you in a little while. The end of this age and your coming. So they believe that His coming will end this age. And a new age will be ushered in. That's what we look forward to. And then Paul tells us in Ephesians 2.17. There will be ages to follow. He tells us in Ephesians 2.7. Sorry. He says that in the ages to come. He will show us the exceeding riches of his grace towards us. And so the ages and ages and ages. That God have different things to do. For us to enjoy. So we put it even though it's a little out of context in these things. But we relate to it and it has spiritual truth to it. I have not seen, neither ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man. What God has prepared for those that love him. Someone said, if God assured us these things. They would be so wonderful, all of us would commit suicide. But we don't, the things that God had for us. So the time of his kingdom. So as you said, we, then he tells them some things that must happen before the kingdom comes. That's the prophecies of Matthew chapter 24. That will happen. Some of it has happened already. Some of it is happening. And some more is to happen. Then also Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> Acts chapter 1. Let me cut some verses down so that we won't have to take up so much time reading. In verse 2, sorry, verse 3. To whom also he showed himself alive, speaking of the apostles, um, after his passion, as after his sufferings, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And for the forty days he was on this earth. He was telling them about this kingdom. Now they had known about this kingdom. Because when John the Baptist we told you came on the scene. Uh, what did he say? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Then the Lord Jesus Christ the first message he preached was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the Jews knew exactly what he meant. It was a kingdom promised in the Old Testament. It's only we that make this kingdom mean heaven. No God has this kingdom and then plus heaven for us. So, the 
The time is not known, but he talked to them about this kingdom. And after he talked to them and so on, and he talked to them about the kingdom, back to Acts, my uh, page got blown. Acts chapter 1. Then they asked him, uh, let's see, in verse 6, after he, told, he, he talked to them about the kingdom, he told them some things, they, he said, they said to him, when, therefore, when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will, will thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Why are they looking forward to this? And so the Lord said, it is not to you to know the time of the season which your father put in his own power, but he shall receive power. I got a job for you to do in the meantime. This kingdom not going to come yet. You know why? Because this kingdom, I promised Abraham that all the nations of this world will be blessed through him. So this is what I want you to do. I want you to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Who's every creature? Yes, both Jew and Gentile. The children of Abraham through Isaac and the children of Abraham through the Lord Jesus Christ. That all who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ will have the promise of Abraham. And he says, I want you to go and preach the gospel. So he says, power, you shall receive power that of the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and unto Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Never thought about this, but now you think Burundi could be the uttermost part of the earth? You never know. And maybe if we go there, then the Lord will come. Because he wants us to go to the uttermost part of the earth. When you not jump up and say, Pastor, let me go tomorrow? I thought you wanted the Lord to come. You should put walk to our talk, right? How about me? You say, oh, sure, Pastor, would you go? Well, I don't want to sound spiritual. But if I knew Lord wanted me to go tomorrow going, what could I do? Be gone. Uh, anyhow, time of his kingdom. In conclusion for this morning, I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11 as we call close. Hebrews chapter 11. And show you how we relate to this kingdom now for this morning. Uh, this is a chapter of what we call the, cha- the roll call of faith. But we'll just deal with two people here. All these people relate to it. But in verse uh, 6, it says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder. Of them that what? Diligently seek him. What's the text? Matthew 6, 23. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. God is a reward of them that diligently seek, he, seek him. So he's telling to you and I. Make an effort to seek him. In Hebrews eleven six. And then uh, go down to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. We're talking to you about Abraham. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For which promise? But people say the land of Israel and so on. But notice what it tells us. For he looked for a city which have foundations whose builder and maker is God. He looked for something beyond that. The, the earthly. Just, you know people say Canaan land. All right, that's part of it. But Abraham was looking for something greater than that. And God didn't explain all that to him. But he knew that God had something better for him. And he would take him from, God to take him from Mesopotamia and put him in Israel. Actually, the land of Mesopotamia at that time was far more fertile than the land of Israel. Maybe still is today. I was looking at the Google map last night about the Euphrates River ribbon, um, running through uh, what we call the Fertile Crescent. The Tigris River and the Euphrates River. One of the most fertile places in this, where they, where they meet. That's where the Garden of Eden is said to be, or used to be. And God took Abraham from the herb of the Chaldees, where it was fertile, and, and took him to the land, desert, a lot of it was. But Abraham saw beyond that. Look at Moses, verse 20, uh, 24. 
Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin, sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Friends, none of us in here could measure up to Abraham in riches. None of us in here could have measured up to Moses in potential, in education, in position, in possessions, who he was to be the next ruler of the world empire, Egypt, and all that went with it. And the Bible tells us that he reset all of those. He says, listen, I know God has offered something better than all of these. But these here, possessions and pleasures of this world and the power and everything else, but for what? They'll be over by and by. But the one that God has prepared for us, dear friend, is an incorruptible crown. Let us, like Abraham and Moses and the others, like Paul and the others, Press toward the mark for the praise of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's take up the exhortation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Father, take these words and use it in our hearts to bring to pass your blessed will in our lives. O oh Lord God, and work in us that we might desire to serve you with great an intense desire and strength and to give our all to see what you have promised us, O oh Lord, that our faith would take hold of these things. I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.